How do threat actors move across different network segments within a larger architecture? Now, lateral movement allows them to move from one host to another within the same segment or VLAN subnet. However, threat actors also frequently seek to traverse from a host in one segment to another in a different segment. This action, known as pivoting, is crucial for expanding access within a network. In today's malware of the day case, we explore tunneling as a method to accomplish this. But first, let's delve into some theory to better grasp the underlying mechanisms and motivations. One common scenario where pivoting is essential for threat actors involves corporate networks segmented into a demilitarized zone known as a DMZ and internal networks. Now, machines in the DMZ, such as web servers, mail servers, FTP servers, etc., are public-facing. That is, they allow systems on the internet to establish inbound connections. Conversely, for security reasons, systems on the internal network typically cannot be accessed from the internet. This ability to allow or disallow network connections based on the host's segment is mediated by a firewall. Now, because DMZ hosts are publicly accessible, they are often easier to compromise. However, for most threat actors, they rarely, if ever, contain anything of value. But what they do represent is an opportunity. Since DMZ hosts can typically communicate directly with systems on the internal network, compromising the former may allow a threat actor to access the latter. Thus, compromising a DMZ host can be seen as a stepping stone to pivot to the internal network where further compromise of internal systems can occur until the threat actor achieves their ultimate goal. So, in today's scenario, a threat actor was able to compromise a web server located within the DMZ of a corporate environment. Once on the web server, they installed a Ligolo NG agent, which performed a reverse TCP callback to a Ligolo NG proxy server listening on their remote system. Once the connection was established, the threat actor was able to determine the presence of the 192.168.200.0/24 internal network, which allowed them to establish a tunnel to the subnet. A network scan was then performed to enumerate specific IPs on the subnet, while also revealing a vulnerability that ultimately allowed the threat actor access to the internal host at 192.168.200.130. In order to perform further post-exploitation activities, the threat actor then installed a Sliver C2 implant, which called back to the Sliver remote server using port 8888 over MTLS. However, since this communication could not be performed directly, it was done so within the context of the tunnel with port forwarding mediated in both directions by the Ligolo NG agent on the internal web server. And so that's the overview of our attack. Now let's move on to the analysis. During our regular network security checks, we collected a day's worth of network traffic in PCAP format from a tap inside the firewall of the DMZ segment. We then converted this PCAP file to Zeek logs and then imported it into a Rita database. At this point, it is now ready for analysis in the AC Hunter interface. Upon opening AC Hunter, we immediately view our dashboard, which in this case only shows a single host IP belonging to our internal web server. Now this is of course because the traffic was captured on the internal side of the DMZ segment. And thus we would not expect the other internal network hosts to appear on this interface. This remains true for our ultimate victim. Though technically the C2 traffic that originated from our ultimate victim at 192.168.200.130 did leave the network at this point, it did so via the Ligolo NG agent on the internal web server and thus externally it appeared to have originated from the internal web server. Now on the right hand side of the dashboard we notice a number of high scores for our beacon and beacon web modules. Digging into these connections further reveal the presence of typical update services such as Google, Mozilla and Canonical. 
Now, one might be surprised that these were picked up and assigned such high scores. But the reason is simple. This is the first time this network has been analyzed and thus the regular business IPs have not yet been safe listed. This reinforces the importance of diligent baselining during the initial phase after adopting AC Hunter, where after no more, or at least very little, such false positive should appear. Now back on the dashboard, something else that does stand, however, is an outbound connection totaling a little over 24 hours. Now though this is a web server, and thus one would expect a large volume of traffic, what one would not expect per se is a single connection lasting for more than a day. Unless an immediate business use case comes to mind, further investigation is warranted. So let's move on to the long connections module. Now upon opening the long connections module, we once again see at the top the long connection of 24 hours, 1 minute and 51 seconds to the external IP 143.198.313. On the top right, we can see that the IP resolves to a resource within the Digital Ocean organization. And we can confirm this by clicking on the IP and selecting among any number of external reputation databases such as VirusTotal, Abuse IPD, Shodan, etc. Now one might be lulled into a false sense of relief that the IP belongs to a reputable company. However, DigitalOcean is one of the largest providers of public cloud services, such as virtual machines, which threat actors love using since they have a strong reputation and can essentially be treated like a disposable commodity. Further, we see about 68.86 megabytes of data that was transferred over an unusual port of 11601 using TCP SSL. Googling this port does not provide an abundance of clear results. But digging a bit lower into the first page of results, we discover that the port belongs to Legolo NG, which its GitHub page explains is a tool used by pen testers. Uh-oh. Even more concerning, however, is another article on the first page of Google results. Now, even though this article does not explicitly mention Legolo NG by name, it does state that the Darktrace, SOC and Threat team have seen a number of incidents starting around January 2024, where long SSL connections were made outbound over port 11601 with several megabytes exchanged. Now, this does unfortunately sound eerily similar to ours. Now at this point, it would be wise to immediately find out if a pen testing engagement is being or has recently been performed on this network. It is also important to mention that we cannot say with 100% certainty that port 11601 usage means it was Legolo NG or that Legolo NG was being used for nefarious purposes, or that it has any relation to the attacks that were reported by Darktrace. Besides, it never pays to panic. But at this point, in all honesty, this case should at the very least be escalated internally to a higher authority for review. For further investigation, we suggest that one analyze the east-west traffic on the interface between the DMZ and the internal network. If indeed a C2 via tunnel compromise has taken place, one would expect an unusually high volume of internal traffic occurring between the DMZ host and one or perhaps a few internal network hosts. Today's malware of the day is interesting for several reasons. Most importantly, it reminds us not to become complacent and succumb to tunnel vision by focusing only upon a singular or small subset of methods of compromise. In the realm of defensive cybersecurity, it pays to never accept anything as self-evident. Deception is the rule, not the exception. Imagine, for example, we placed all our energy and attention on analyzing traffic exiting the internal network. Since this is, after all, where the systems and data we are most concerned with reside. Well, in a case such as presented here, where traffic is tunneled from the internal network through the DMZ and then exits the network from that segment, we would completely miss this compromise. Threat actors love using tunnels, whether that be Legolo NG, Chisel or proxy chains. So it is important to remain vigilant on all egress points and not just those you view as being sensitive. Additionally, it's worth pointing out that even though our C2 implant was indeed beaconing 5 seconds with a jitter of 60%, AC Hunter reported no beaconing associated with this connection. For example, if we look at the attacker IP in the deep dive module, 
we can see here that no beacon is detected. Now this is not due to some error on AC Hunter's part. Rather, as mentioned before, all the C2 traffic was happening in the context of the tunnel. So not only did our C2 victim IP and port 888 for MTLS not appear, but the actual beaconing behavior itself was cloaked by the tunnel. This is important to note because beaconing was originally used to hoodwink defenders who at that time were solely focused on long connections. This is of course back in the good old days when Metasploit reigned supreme. But today beaconing technology is itself mature and well known. Thus, herein lies a danger that we hope today's case may serve as an antidote against. Don't become so overly obsessed with looking for beacons that one forgets to look for the long connections right under one's nose. And so that's it for today's case. You can refer to the link right at the top of the description, which will take you to our website where you can download the PCAPs and Zeke logs to follow along. We invite you to do so to really solidify your knowledge and understanding of this unique attack type. We hope you enjoyed this episode and until next time, keep well.